Hello, welcome to the SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today, our interesting person is Rebecca Durham, a botanist who studies plants and also fungi and also algae and also, no? Lichens. Lichens. What, Bio- what is a lichen? A lichen is a symbiosis between, between a fungi oh, yeah. and an algae and or cyanobacteria. Okay. okay. So, but okay, I'm clo- <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I, did, I got close enough. That was good. Um, so you are, right now, your active area of study is these bio crusts. These That's right. living soil matrix things that I do not understand. And they look like they came from another planet and they're like these tiny little forests that tiny fairies live in. And I think they're beautiful and wonderful. Are these from around here? They are, yep, they're oh, from wow. just, I didn't even know just, we had yeah. such. Yeah, so yeah, biological soil crusts are really important all around the world in arid and semi-arid environments. Okay. Um, these are about, you know, from about 20 miles south of Missoula and, you know, in a lot of the grasslands and sage steppe areas, um, the, the biological soil crust plays a really big component in the ecosystem. Um, ours are a little, you know, most people aren't are only aware of bio crust in the southwest, like around Canyonlands mm-hmm. and that area, um, because of all the signage and things like that. Here they're just as important. They're probably a little bit less fragile here than they are down there, because down there you can have just just a thin layer of a, of a um, bio crust species and then dirt and a mm-hmm. sand and it's like kind of humped up and if you step on it it, it, it shatters. Now here our crusts you know obviously they are um, you know they've evolved with with larger ungulates and things like that the, the mm-hmm. you know the elk can walk on some of these crusts and, and they won't just you know fall apart. So they're a little hardier here but they can be easily disturbed um, especially with um, you know ATVs or right. a recreational um, vehicles, things like that. Yeah, and, and these are fragile things, because I always went up right. in a national park and right. be like, cryptobiotic crust, careful, right. don't t- don't walk on that. That's true. It's not just dirt, it's right. more than that. It's true. What's the difference when I say cryptobiotic crust, because that's what they always say on the signs right. of the national park. Yeah. So what they, is that? The naming has evolved over the years. They're, they've been called- Because probably cryptobiotic yeah. crust was a little too esoteric. Yeah, it sounds- yeah, It people, sounds awesome. Yeah, cryptogamic, cryptobiotic, um, microbiotic. Okay, that's a little um, less awesome. Biological soil crust has been. Eh. We were kind of using that and shortening to bio crust. That's the, that's like the thing now is bio crust. Where where does somebody find like if I wanted to go find one of these on my own, where would I go? Um, anywhere where there's a grassland or a or a you know area with like sage step, you know, kind of uh, shrubland grassland that hasn't mm. had tons and tons of disturbance, you'll find crust. Um, they there's there's like higher diversity and more crust coverage on, you know, more north-facing um, aspects around here. Mm. The aspect can be a real, real big. Um, Does it'll stay wetter on that side? Yeah, or? it gets a little more shade. It has yeah. a little more moisture, so um, it, it kind of it makes the crust component a little, a little richer than. But even on the even the really hot south-facing, really rocky stuff in the bunch grasses, like the edge of the bunch grass, if you look in mm. there, oh, there's some centrichia. So it's it's everywhere. I haven't seen one spot on the ranch that we've surveyed, even the places that have been um, just hammered with um, disturbance from, from the past. Um, everywhere has crust, everywhere I look, so. Oh. How did you? How did you start doing this? How did you get into that? Did you mean to become a bio crust <laughs> specialist? You know, I I've been I've been always interested in lichens. I took um, lichenology from Bruce McEwen when I was in grad school at OSU, and um, so I, a few years ago I looked at the lichens, the macro lichens at the ranch, and um, I was at a conference and. There was a researcher talking about um, just kind of his successes and failures in restoration, and he, and he was talking about work that he was doing in Southern California, and he said, yeah, we would just put a bunch of stuff in the burlap bag, you know, that was going to be disturbed, and then we'd go and just shake it over it afterwards, and he's like, when well, we grew crust, and I was like, is it just that easy? You know, if it is, that's fabulous, right? And I want to I want to do that. So um, anyway, awesome. I met this, um, I met a... a a PhD student, Mandy Slate, at a, 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 a moss sort of gathering and... Um, Wait, a moss gathering? Yeah, it's actually called So Be Free. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they have them every year. It's actually really fun They around the West. I, so I went to this uh, a moss gathering and um, <laughs> people, you know, they just look at mosses and everyone just, it's, you know, a bunch of 
biologists Ma and moss yeah. enthusiasts, and it's fabulous. So anyway, <laughs> I met her, and we, we, you know, where I was like, she was interested, and so we started. Um, we have this um, um, a restoration project going for a moss and biocrust, and right now we we've really successfully grown a lot of centrichia, which is great. But that kind of like sparked that collaboration, and mm -hmm. so, and then, you know, here I am. So I'm. You've got a bunch of different samples here. I assume these are all different species of lichen. Are they all lichen, or are they? Um, mix there's of different some things? moss mixed in here. Okay. Um, no, the the algae we isn't isn't a huge component. Um, we do see it, and then the there's also in here. I mean, what we're looking at in in um, biocross are um, lichens, mosses, algae. Um, cyanobacteria, free living fungi. Mm. Um, so what we're what we're really when we're studying biocrust, we're kind of looking at the macroscopic things um, mostly. So we're looking at the lichen species and we're looking at the moss species. Um, so there's other there's another there's more like you know microscopic matrix of other species in there. But really what we're looking at here are the lichens and the mosses. So they kind of grow all all interspersed. In some areas you have higher um, lichen coverage than others, and some some it's, it's more moss dominated. It mm -hmm. partly depends on the the site. So, but the diversity is really high in um, in the lichens. So we we we've have maybe about a dozen moss species that we've identified so far. It's part of the crust, um, but the there's a probably about um, about sixty five different lichen species that we have found so far. So the diversity is really high. And they're really intricate and fascinating. So here we have, um, so this is Peltigera. This is a cyanolichen. So it has cyanobacteria in it. Mm -hmm. So it's fixing nitrogen as well. Um, and that's a really common common one in the system. So this is happening on soil rather than like, mostly when I think of lichen, I think of it happening on rocks. Um, well, lichen will colonize pretty much any surface. Okay. All, you know, anything that is stable surface and there's actually even one lichen that lives underwater. Um, but most lichens can live anywhere. So, so, you know, when you're looking at the, like the stuff hanging down from the trees, people are like, oh, look at that moss. That's usually a lichen. In our huh. area, it's all lichen. So, um, so lichens are in the trees. They're on bark. They're on rock. Right, right. Um, but they're everywhere. They're, they're on bones. So, so but this is, yeah, go ahead. This, this lichen would grow in, where, like, in lots of different places. It wouldn't just grow as a biocrust, or does it, are there some that prefer? Right, so, so there, are, there are some species that prefer, you know, there are definitely species that prefer certain habitats. So like the, all the, um, the Peltigera, so this is a Peltigera, um, they all grow on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't find them like growing up in the trees or something like right. that. And so, and there are certain species of Peltigera like this one that likes to grow out in the open in the bio crust, but there's also some that are a little bit more moisture loving. They'll be in the forest on the forest floor doing a little bit different thing, like growing in, in interspersed with the leaf litter mm -hmm. layer and things like that. So this this structure isn't just made of biological life, though. There's also inorganic matter in there, and like that, it feels like that, that like it's not just happening on top; it's also happening inside. That's right. And is that that's sort of like the thing that makes biocrust biocrust? Well, I mean, it's 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 the top few centimeters of of the of the you know of the soil. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have you have a lot going in. You, so you, so a lot of these these lichens they'll make not not roots, but they have like you know rhizines, rhizoids, like kind of things that are going in and and like physically mm -hmm. stabilizing. Then then in that yeah, you have an organic you know non-living layer of, of nutrients and things like that that are all like going on and even smaller things. And then you have the, th the parts of the bio crust that are sticking up. Right, on you know, top. So, yeah, yeah, on top. So it is, you know, it is like a, you know, the, the bio crust layer is, you know, what's on top a little bit and then what's on, on below a little bit. So it's the living layer and there are non -or there's non-organic component to right, that. Right, so and, and that's sort of like a, uh... It's a stabilizer, I imagine. That like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so bio, so bio crusts play a huge role in reducing erosion, and um, you know, soil stabilization and and nutrient cycling. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot happening um, just in these top few layers. You know, every time a moss um, um, hydrates and and dehydrates, it, it there's like a little tiny nutrient pulse of like shedding from the leaves of the of the mosses. Mm. So there's there's you know there's nutrient cycling happening on like a really really small scale. Are these all dead now or do they still live? Um they they so 
So the thing about biocrust, which is so fascinating, is lichens and mosses are able to tolerate extreme um, desiccation tolerance. You know, mm -hmm. they, they are like drought, they can just hang out for a really long time and they're totally fine. Um, and so what, what that, actually that has a really nice word, it's called poikilohydri. Okay, <laughs> we'll spell it out okay. on the bottom. And that's the, that's the ability to, um, you know, to really just have these drought situations and not have cell, cellular damage, which mm. is what happens to most um, vascular plants. So, um, so these will become Just biologically active if we, we like spray spread them. some water. Yeah, you know, and I should have brought a water bottle and we could, you know, watch them because because of the mosses will just go whoop. Oh and that's why they can find, you know, like 400 year old mosses, like, you know, pulling out of like an ice sheet or something. And mm -hmm. it's still like viable, right? Because these things that can just hang out for a really long time and then like, you know, come back. So this is more mossy thing happening here. Yep, that's okay. um, that's um, Gemma, Gemma Bryum um, cespitisium. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> that's one of the real common biocrust mosses there. I feel like I've probably stepped on this before and not even thought about it. Is that possible? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most people, I mean, even this is, there's all sorts of new slogans, right? Well, they're not new, but you can say, don't bust the crust, tiptoe the crypto, or mm -hmm. in crust we trust. So if we want to, you know, I, and I just, you know, we need to spread the word because so many people, even, even ecologists, even researchers will go out and, and look at the landscape and they won't even think about, uh, about this um, soil crust mm -hmm. layer either, you know, mm -hmm. so, but it's obviously a huge part of the system. Cool. So do you want to meet an animal? Now? I would love to meet okay, an animal. Good. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. hello, I'm glad I still have my hand lens. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is Puzzle. Nice. Do you know what Puzzle is? A Anybody? snake. And you probably shouldn't touch it right oh, in the face. Oh, yeah. Ooh, nice work. Nice <laughs> work. It's not like a cat where you're like, smell me. <laughs> no, don't let it smell you. No, no, not in the face. <laughs> All right, snake. It's Nicely a, done. Well, a, you know, it could have been a lizard. That's true. It could have been one of those glass... Last yeah, night. legless lizards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's not. It is a snake. Uh, it's a constrictor. It is a type of constrictor. Is it a boa? Not a boa. Is it a python? Yes. Okay. Oh. Nice work. Nice how, work. How could I tell the difference? How how would I have known if I was the kind of person who would know? Um, you you would look at their facial structures, but also you'd you'd also study you know how they give birth. Oh right, right. So like <laughs> so if I was really paying attention. Python would lay eggs, and a boa would retain the eggs, and then they would hatch inside, giving birth to kind of fake live birth. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And she is fully mature. She's fully grown. Oh. Um, these guys yeah. are small. They're like three to five feet. And, I wouldn't and necessarily biggest call that small. <laughs> well, or considering or like a, a python. reticulated python yeah. that gets up to 30 feet. Yes. Three to five feet is pretty small. Pretty small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they get their name for, can you guess how they got their name, ball python? Ball, I don't know, do they go up in a little ball? They juggle balls. No. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, they roll up into a ball. And a lot of snakes, or a, a handful of snakes, I guess will roll up into a ball and put their heads on the inside as a defensive mechanism. Okay. But these guys are like, once they do that, you cannot un... You cannot, they're like, you're, they're like your headphones. After you accidentally put them in the dryer. Exactly. Yeah, it's like that. Yep. It's like Just that forever. Might as well throw them away. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, that's, they get their common name because they roll up into a ball and they just they sit there and that's it. But Puzzle is happy right now, so. She's not feeling upset. The first sign that I would know that she was upset is she'd hiss. She'd ex exhale mm. a bit. She'd be like, oh, I'm annoyed. Mm -hmm. um, but if she was scared, yeah, she'd roll up into a ball. But look, we call her Puzzle because she has really cool yeah, really pattern cool on her. Yeah. Um, and if you look closely, look at some of these. Eye spots? Yeah. <laughs> like an alien. Does. Head looks like here. an alien yeah. head with eyes. So when they roll up into a ball, it actually looks like faces. A bunch of things looking at and you. so whatever predator is going, they're like, whoa, 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 I didn't, I didn't want to take off on 10 of you. I, I'm, I'm out. Yes. How long do they live? They can live up to 30 years. Wow. Um, average is about 20. I shouldn't say up to 30 years. I mean, 30 is really doing really good. They right. can. The, the oldest was 48, I believe, wow. um, but average is about 20, 10 in the wild, because um, they do have quite a few predators. Mm. They are also um, hunted by humans. Um, they were captured a lot for the pet trade, and there's still a bunch of them, like uh, 30 to 50,000 are still exported from Africa into mm. the pet trade. They're also um, taken for food, 
and for leather. So right now they're not threatened, but they are kind of close um, because they can adapt so well to habitat destruction mm -hmm. or change. Um, they're actually doing, okay. doing pretty good. Have I talked to you about yes. how snakes uh, constrict their prey? Mm. So, so oh, new yeah. research. Okay. Um, we used to think that snakes would strike and then suffocate their prey, right? Mm -hmm. And every time I, I was taught um, ten years ago that they would the prey would exhale and they would squeeze tighter and then right. exhale and squeeze mm -hmm. tighter and tighter yep, until they couldn't. Yeah. yeah. So that's not that's, that's not how they actually kill it. Well, they <laughs> okay. might do that, yeah. but the thing that's actually killing that animal is they are squeezing so tight that they're stopping the blood from pumping from the heart mm -hmm. into the rest of their body. Mm -hmm. So they're actually mm -hmm. having kind of a, a heart attack because they can't right. get mm -hmm. the. Yeah. You just pass out. It's like a headlock. Yeah, and it's quicker than <laughs> it's quicker yeah. than uh, suffocation. suffocation. So these guys are like mm -hmm. the best mm -hmm. predators, the most humane, I guess, predators. Well, and t except for the part where <laughs> you know you're eating them alive sometimes. Well, they, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just sometimes though. <laughs> These guys are cool because, like some other python species, they don't just lay their eggs and leave. Most snakes do that. Um, so these guys will actually curl up on their clutch of eggs and sit there until they hatch, which is about two months. Hmm. Um, and not eat, not leave, nope. just stay there the just whole time? Just stay there. And they, they, they think the, the main reason they do that is to prevent uh, moisture loss, and so that they can be a nice heavy weight and, and produce mm -hmm. a, a heavy offspring. Um, but they can also, which I think is super cool, they are ectothermic, so they can actually heat up their clutch of eggs if it starts getting too cold, mm -hmm. up to seven degrees Fahrenheit, so they will shiver mm. and then raise the temperature to make sure they don't get too cold. I think that's awesome. Yeah, this whole, this whole differentiation between the warm-blooded and cold-blooded, it's all, it's, uh, there's, it's always, not, there's always exceptions. Yes, yes, always. It's always a fuzzy line. Hmm. Do, you want, do you want to try and hold her? Sure. But uh, yeah, you can, it's, it's always a little surprising how cold a snake is when you touch wow. it for me. Cool. <laughs> She's beautiful. I like uh, how they are so different on the bottom as opposed mm -hmm. to the top. They have these little tiny scales on the bottom and then these big scales on the, sorry, little scales on the top and big scales on the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to feel the, the muscle move like in your hands, like. Now, how, what is the muscular system like for a snake? So, I mean, the, the whole, they have just the same as F, two really long, long jissimi dorsi that go oh. down the sides of their spine there. Um, but the way that they move is um, they move against themselves. And so they're pushing, she's propelling from back here, huh. propelling herself forward. And then she'll see if she, she's kind of kinked around my shoulder, my finger here. So she's going to then use this muscle to pull the rest of her body oh, wow. forward. Cool. Um, I've heard that the muscles of snakes are more like the muscles of fish. Okay. Not like physiolog well, physiologically, not like biochemically or anything, but because they are, you know, it's all about this motion. Yes. And so it's muscles pulling on muscles. Yes. Rather than most of our muscles pull on bones. Yes, yes, yep, it's muscle against muscle work for them, and that's mm -hmm. how they're, yeah. And then they also, it's not just muscles helping them move. It's also their scales. Oh, so yeah. if you run your finger this way, it's very smooth. Right. So she'd be going forward. Mm -hmm. But then if you went this way, you could actually catch mm -hmm. a scale. And I'm not, right. I, it's uncomfortable for them, so I don't really like to do it. Mm -hmm. But you could actually catch a scale because they're all facing this direction. Mm -hmm. So if she's trying to go up a tree or she's trying to go up a, um, a rocky area, those scales will actually prevent her from slipping backwards. And so she can continue to use her muscles mm -hmm. and her scales. Good girl. E easy enough. Oh, we're very lucky to have you in town and also Puzzle in town. Yeah. That's very cool. If you want to see more of what Jessie does and, and check out her, she has a YouTube channel mm -hmm. where she talks about all of the animals that she works with. You've got over 80 animals at Animal Wonders. You can find that at youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. It's always so fun. And thank you for joining us. Remember, don't bust the crust. Thank you all for watching. If you want to watch more, you can go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe. These that anchor them into the tunnel, and then they kind of lunge out at any prey that comes by. So they're like these, you know, B-movie monsters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lunging out. So you